Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm Brendan Gogarty, a member of the Kirsten Center for Human Rights Law uh, and an academic with the Faculty of Law at Monash University. I reiterate uh, Professor Hordigan's acknowledgement of the traditional owners uh, of the land upon which I sit and which we gather the peoples of the Kulin Nation uh, nations, their ancestors, uh, and the children we are nurturing for tomorrow. Um, in this session, we intend to explore the intersection of climate protest and law from a human rights lens, and two speakers will provide insights into uh, the recent laws affecting uh, climate protests. That's Professor Asda Dastieri and Violet Coco. And they'll be offering both act, uh, academic and activist viewpoints. The intention uh, today is for me to set the scene about the current state of climate governance, or more likely the, uh, the failure of climate governments, and, and as a consequence, the rise of climate protest as a necessary um, uh, motivator for climate action against the emergency that we face. And then Professor Dastiari and Vala Coco will deliver talks uh, before having a joint conversation and then opening uh, up to the floor for a Q&A session. I encourage you to contribute to the social, uh, to the conversation um, by asking questions, particularly here in the chat window. Um, but uh, as I understand, we also are on social media, although, as Melissa said, um, possibly one of the older forms of social, social media, Twitter. I don't think we're on threads as far as I'm aware. Um, but if you are on Twitter, we are uh, uh, tweeting using the handle Kasten Center, which you can see on the top left of the screen, and the hashtag uh, Human Rights 23. Um, we've also posted some audience guidelines in the chat uh, itself to keep the conversation inclusive and to keep it focused. If you would like to remain anonymous, uh, please let us know. Uh, we'll pick some questions for the Q&A session after the presentations. So. Uh, to my role, which is to set the conversation, uh, the stage for the conversation today, um, which is unfortunately uh, a, an overly easy task, um, given the, the serious climate emergency we're facing right now. And I have just here selected uh, a, a few stories, news stories from the last week uh, that show uh, it's not a, a, a distant threat climate change. This is a reality right now. As we speak, um, much of the Northern Hemisphere is suffering from unheard of heat-induced crises. The World Meteorological Organization confirmed uh, that last week uh, for the third consecutive week was 1.71 degrees Celsius above the 20th century average. That made it the hottest week on record since we began keeping these records in 1880. And the WMO warned that, I quote, these are, will create devastating impacts on the ecosystem and the environment, and these uncharted temperatures risk uh, devastation to the human communities that live at one with our natural world, uh, and especially the vulnerable communities that are part of that natural world, and vulnerable communities that don't have the capacity or the resources to buy themselves or build themselves out of the emergency. So this is a, a real human rights crisis. Uh, and as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Adverse Effects of uh, the Environment on the Enjoyment of Human Rights reported in 2021, climate change is and will increasingly be a threat multiplier that is exacerbating every single one of our existing human rights and it will create more and more human rights violations from our right to life, to health and food, to our rights to water, to sanitation, to housing, to development, no aspect of our lives will remain un untouched by this existential crisis. The thing is, we have understood this and these risks for many, many decades. Uh, and uh, the first intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change reported in 1990 uh, that we needed uh, immediate reductions in emissions from human activities. Uh, of over 60%, that number being very important uh, because of what's just been reported by the International Energy Agency. But in 1990, over three decades ago, when, as Melissa was saying, we were also grappling with uh, in indigenous rights in cases like Mabo, um, the, uh, the IPCC said we need to stabilize concentrations uh, uh, by uh, reducing emissions by 60%. 
And, and those warnings um, and broader warnings from the scientific community um, uh, led to a, a really rapid negotiation of uh, an international convention, the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that was seen as a real shift in global governance. So it promised so much. And if you look at the, the UNFCCC, it promises from its outset to prevent dangerous anthropocentric interference with the climate system, 1990. 198 countries ratified that convention. Uh, and we've had 30 years of, of work together with those 198 countries. But so far, uh, that apparent consensus has failed to translate into actual global action. And uh, in fact, since 1992, emissions have not gone down by that 60% recommended by the IPCC in 1990, but they have increased according to the International Energy Agency by 62%. So not decreased by 60% as we agreed we were going to do, but increased by 62%. Australia plays a significant role in this narrative of failure and inaction. Uh, the politics of this country are uh, unfortunately steeped in a history of undermining uh, international climate negotiations, making promises, but then under delivering. And we know that around the Kyoto Protocol and in other provisions. Domestically, Australia's climate target is not aligned with our uh, international target of keeping global warming under 1.5 or 2%. Despite the recent national law reforms that you may have heard of and promises made under the global framework, uh, a range of fossil fuel projects and subsidies have been proposed or, or provided permits, and these will actually increase Australia's net uh, uh, emissions of 1.4 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2030, which means that we will increase our carbon output, not reduce it despite our Paris promises. So that's where we stand. We stand with a, a huge amount of knowledge, an addiction to carbon, a, a lack of effectiveness in our governance system in, in dealing with the existential crisis that we face. And in the face of this governmental and institutional failure, non-governmental actors and activists worldwide have had to resort to taking action into their own hands. Climate protests have become more vocal, they've become more widespread, symbolizing a distrust with conventional governance systems, with traditional law, and its ability to deal with the problem in any meaningful way. And this collective action against climate inaction is not just about climate change, it's about our human rights, our future, our children's future, the future of the planet and all the generations that come uh, and will live in it, in it, hopefully, into that future. Concerningly, though, lawmakers haven't reacted in the way that you might hope. They haven't turned their attention to reforming the law based on this dis dissatisfaction, reforming the law to improve its efficiency or its ability to reduce the risks of climate change. Rather, law reform has often been directed in Australia in particular to reducing the perceived risks from the protesters themselves. That's where the attention has gone. And a raft of laws have been passed in Australia over the last decade seeking uh, to discourage, to dissuade protest actions through expansive police powers, through aggravated penalties and harsh sentences to create a chilling effect on those who might speak out against the ineffectiveness of our domestic and global governance systems. So to speak, speaker from this session, that's Professor uh, Asda Dastieri, and, and uh, as is the founding director of the Network for Law and Human Rights and a professor of uh, law in the School of Law at the University of Western Sydney, but she has a long connection with the Kasten Centre. She was Deputy Director for the Kasten Centre from 2007 to 2019, a very significant tenure, as his passion for protecting uh, um, protest, though, is personal, uh, as tells me she was born uh, in the Iranian Revolution to activists. Uh, her childhood was marked by protests. Her father, as I understand, missed her birth because he was at a sit-in um, so having inherited her parents' commitment to social change, as has been involved in a number of social movements, including the protection of refugee rights, and maybe that might come up in our conversation, because obviously climate change will be a massive driver of, uh, of human movement, both uh, internally but also across borders. Uh, and as now rights on digital inclusion and the uh, and international human rights law dimensions of the right to protest. So an amazing expert to have here today. And I'll stop talking and turn over to Az. 
Thank you, Brendan. My dad's going to love the fact that I shared that with you. <laughs> it will never live it down. Um, it's really lovely to be back here at the Casson Centre, as Brendan mentioned. I spent a quarter of my life as Deputy Director of this centre, and it is so wonderful to see this brilliant organisation flourishing. Uh, it really is a gem, has always been, always will be uh, a real highlight of um, the international human rights law community. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging that I live and work on the lands of the Barramatic Gold people of the Darug Nation in Western Sydney, but today I'm zooming in from the lands of the Kulin Nations. I want to pay my respects to Elders past and present, recognise that sovereignty was never ceded and extend that respect to any uh, Indigenous participants in the audience today. Um, the, you know, the often violent project of colonization continues today and one of the many ways that First Nations peoples have uh, led the resistance uh, to this oppression has been through protest. But as we're going to talk about today, it is becoming more and more difficult in Australia to protest and to protest safely and legally. And that's where focusing on climate change protests, but of course, it, this suppression of protests, this proliferation of anti-protest laws affects all social movements and all attempts to create something better in this country. Uh, the move to suppress protests is absolutely not new. We all know that there have been attempts to suppress protests for many years, from, from, from the beginning of uh, this colony. Um, but what we've seen, frighteningly, is a real proliferation of anti-protest laws, and anti-protest laws that have successfully gone through parliaments as well in the last four years, mostly as a response to uh, protesters who are trying to draw attention to imminent climate catastrophe that Brendan was talking about. Um, and the international community is noticing. So the tweet that I have on stage is from the UN Special Rapporteur on the uh, for Freedom of Association and Expression, who expresses alarm at the arrest and prison term given to my wonderful uh, co-panelist today, Violet Coco, for her uh, arrest and uh, initial uh, imprisonment for peacefully protesting. Uh, Violet was charged under changes made to the Crimes Act uh, and the Roads Act by the Roads and Crimes Legislation Amendment Act of 2022, so last year, uh, which was passed under a coalition government, but with full support of the Labor opposition at the time, um, who did get some concessions for industrial actions and unions, but um, left a lot of the anti-protest legislation intact which um, introduced a number of act, uh, activities, including um, a number of penalties, 200 penalty units, which is about $22,000, or imprisonment of two years for activities such as damaging or disturbing a major facility, seriously disrupting or obstructing vehicles or pedestrians, um, and remaining on or near, remember this one, I'm going to come back to it, climbing, jumping from or otherwise trespassing on or blocking entry to any part of a major facility. And then they pass regulation, which define major facility very, very uh, broadly. The law does other things, but they were the ones I wanted to highlight for you. Uh, whilst this piece of legislation um, got international attention, it's not the only one to have raised international eyebrows. In December 2019, four United Nations mandate holders wrote to the Australian government with serious concerns about a Queensland piece of legislation, this one, the Summary Offences and Other Legislation Amendment Act, which created new criminal offences, expanded police powers to search and seize, and intensified penalties for assemblies that use certain attachment devices. Here in Victoria, um, you're not going to be left behind. Uh, Victoria passed the Sustainable Forest Timber Amendment, Timber Harvesting Safety Zones Act uh, last year as well in 2022, which imposes harsh and really disproportionate penalties against protesters who act to prevent native forest logging in Victoria in uh, what they call timber and harvesting safety zones. 
um, with fines up to $21,000. I mean, these fines are unbelievable, or 12 months jail. Um, and the law gives authorised officers broad and really quite dangerously intrusive stop and search powers as well. Tasmania has been in the news recently. You would have heard last week um, that Colette Hasman has been sentenced to three months in jail over her protests against mining in Tasmania's northwest. She was charged four counts of trespass, one count of willfully obstructing the use of any road and failure to comply with uh, the directions of a police officer. Um, Tasmania has made many attempts to pass anti-protest laws, but the latest I did get through was the Police Offences Amendment Workplace Protection Act, which again passed last year. So much happened last year, everyone, um, which makes protesters who obstruct access to a workplace as part of a protest liable to face 12 months in prison, a community member protecting the destruction of old growth forests uh, on a forestry site can now face penalty of over $13,000 or two years in prison, and an organisation impeding or carrying out lawful work could be fined over $45,000. But the harshest fines in Australia at the moment belong to South Australia. Um, the latest piece of legislation to be passed is South Australia's Summary Offences Obstruction of Public Places Amendment Act, which just passed um, last month. It was a centre to on the 1st of June. Um, the Act, amongst other things, increases the penalty for obstructing a public place from $750 to $50,000. Uh, or imprisonment for three months. And as I said, these are the harshest fines in the country. The laws also allow the prosecution to apply for a court order that defendants pay the cost of um, expenses of any emergency services that might be required. And what's really interesting is under the Act, obstruction can be caused directly or indirectly, which means that the implementation is even broader, it gives police even broader powers. It's really concerning stuff for so many different reasons, but I'm an international human rights lawyer, so I want to talk to you a little bit about why this is particularly concerning when we look at it through the lens of international human rights law. There's no specific provision under international human rights law that says that you, we have a right to protest. So here when I'm talking about protest, I'm talking about public um, acts of dissent, you know, things like my dad sit, doing a sitting or um, assemblies, demonstrations, those kinds of things is what I'm particularly concerned about today. But um, the protection of public acts of dissent that we're concerned with today comes mostly under two provisions in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, Article 19 and 21. And I'll take you through both of those uh, in a little bit more detail. So Article 19 is a protection of the freedom of political uh, 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 freedom of expression. Interestingly, the act of protesting, putting your body in a physical space to demonstrate dissent, is viewed as expression. So any attempts to stop you from expressing your views, is a violation of Article 19. But that right under Article 19 is not absolute. So when we read Article 19 of the ICCPR, we have to see it in the context of also Article 20 of the ICCPR, which states that any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence is not only not protected, but states have an obligation to criminalise such behaviour. So, you know, Nazis that claim that they have freedom of expression and uh, the attempts to stop them protesting goes against their human right are, are wrong um, because you, they can't claim that international uh, law protects their desire to spout hate through protest. The other really important provision we need to know about is Article 21, um, 
which protects freedom of peaceful assembly. So the right for us to assemble together, to gather together in groups. But this right is not absolute either. For assembly to be protected under international human rights law, it needs to be peaceful. And I'll explain to you in a second what that actually means. And states do have a right to limit protest if they believe that limiting that assembly is necessary in a democratic society. And the fact that they've put a democratic society in there is critical because there's a recognition that assembly and protest is important for a democracy. But if states believe that it is necessary in a democratic society to suppress protest because of national security or public safety or public order or the protection of public health and morals or the protection of the rights and freedom of others, they are able to do that. But again, the Human Rights Committee has expressed again and again this idea that the right to protest is critical. And if states are going to limit protests, this has to be balanced against the importance of the right to protest. I'm not going to take you through all of these permissible limitations. There's just a couple I want to focus on. Um, peaceful protest is a really important one. And what I want you to really understand is that just because a protest is inconvenient, and many protests are inconvenient, that's why they're effective, doesn't mean it's not peaceful. There's a really high threshold for what makes a, um, a protest not peaceful. Uh, and the Human Rights Committee has said, if a protest is likely to result in injury or death, then it's not peaceful. And a protest is assumed to be peaceful and any state wanting to limit protests really has to uh, have credible evidence that there is going to be violence. The other really important thing is that having one or two people in a protest act in a way that is not considered peaceful doesn't make the protest itself uh, not peaceful and therefore not earn the right to be protected. If they could do that, then agent provocateurs could be used by states to kind of instigate violence and then say, hey, the protest is, is violent, therefore we have to suppress it. Now, of course, this happens. We know this happens all the time all over the world, but it is not something that international law permits. So the presence of a few violent actors doesn't make the protest violent. Uh, it remains peaceful. The other thing that I think many people are concerned with at the moment, as we're in the middle of a pandemic still, is that states can take measures to protect the health of a population. Uh, so measures taken to stop protests, say the anti-vax protests, for example, where the health of the community may have been put at risk, are permitted under international law. However, there's a limit to how much you can use health as an excuse to suppress protests. So if you have protesters in cars, for example, in a pandemic who have no way of infecting other people and are doing it safely, then the state doesn't have a right to suppress their protest. So uh, the suppression of protests can only go as far as needed to keep people safe. And finally, the last thing I wanted to mention, because states often call on this, is that the establishing that a protest is a threat to national security also has a really, really high bar. To say that something is a threat to national security, states have to establish that um, it will affect the functioning of society. And not many protest actions are going to have an effect on the functioning of society. You know, as an aside, probably catastrophic climate change is going to have an effect on the functioning of society, but it's unlikely that protest um, actions that we're used to seeing in Australia will have that effect. So thinking back now to the anti-protest laws that have been passed in the last few years that I began my talk with, 
It's really clear, of course, that we are going so much further in Australia, in many of our jurisdictions, than is permissible under Article 19 and 21 of the ICCPR, even given that international human rights law is not without limitation in its pro protection of protest. So what do we do about it? Um, in the absence of a Bill of Rights, there's not all that much that we can do about it. There is an implied freedom of political communication under the Australian Constitution. But as my students who have just done their constitutional law exam, who are, if they're here or having flashbacks, will be able to tell you, um, it's a very limited right. And of course, doesn't go nearly as far as what Articles 19 and 21 of the ICCPR demand of us. Um, it's not a personal right, for example. Um, and it only protects us from legislation that impedes political communication. Now, acts of protest are considered political communication. So uh, the pieces of legislation I briefly discussed at the beginning of this talk would fall into this category of legislation that does uh, uh, impede political communication. The thing is that if a court believes that legislation placing a burden on protest is stopping protest for a legitimate purpose, and if the court believes that legislation is suitable, necessary and adequate in its balance, the anti-protest laws will be upheld. One argument that can be made with a lot of the anti-protest laws that we're seeing in Australia at the moment is that they're not necessary. There's, there are already provisions that prohibit a lot of the uh, criminal activity or anti-social activity that the many parliaments are claiming these anti-protest laws will target. Um, and that they're even acknowledging this. So in passing um, the New South Wales anti-protest laws, for example, there was a real acknowledgement that, you know, laws already exist, but do they go far enough and are, are they doing enough? So, you know, there's an argument that these laws are not necessary and that there, a balance isn't being reached in Australia between uh, the legitimate purpose that they may be serving and the uh, importance of political communication to our democracy. Um, and it's this uh, inadequacy of balance that is being used to challenge these anti-protest laws in court. So right now, um, the Knitting Nanas are a brilliant organisation. So if you're not familiar with their work, um, as my homework, please go and look up the Knitting Nanas and the wonderful work that they do. Um, but Knitting Nanas, Helen Kevill and Dominique Jacobs are at present challenging the New South Wales anti-protest laws. Um, in addition to saying that the laws are not adequate in their balance, they're also arguing that the part of the legislation that says that a person must not enter, remain or be near a major facility is super vague. I mean, what does it mean? Would a teenager holding um, a climate change protest sign next to a train station um, fall foul of these laws and be liable to pay $22,000? Probably at the moment as the, the law stands. So, um, It'll be really interesting to see how they go in the challenge. And I would suspect that there'll be many more challenges to these anti-protest laws as we continue. Um, but it wouldn't be a human rights talk if I didn't end by calling for the need for a Bill of Rights. Um, it would make it so much easier to challenge these anti-protest laws if we had a Bill of Rights. We need to be really, really worried about the proliferation of anti-protest laws across our country. Uh, protest is as democratic as they come. You don't have to own a newspaper. You don't have to own a social media site. You don't have to own a coal mine in order to have your opinions heard. If you have a body that you can put in physical space, you have a platform. And we know protest is effective because so many of the things we hold sacred in our democracy, rights of women, uh, labour rights, so many rights have been won through protest. And at a time, as Brendan mentioned, that we you know, really need to act urgently to mitigate 
this imminent climate disaster that we're facing, it's not the protesters that we need to be locking up. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asda. Um, uh, I, the very telling talk, um, and I think everyone will be uh, quite surprised at just the degree of of penalties that are being imposed across the country. That this threat, um, which we might have a chance to reflect on later, and, and I'll, I'll move to Violet next, but. Um, we don't need to go, we'll have this conversation, but one of the challenges I think has been the High Court's willing to apply the implied freedom that you speak about to the, the, the elements of a crime uh, and say, well, the law itself is not necessary. But once the court has determined the, the law is constitutionally valid, it tends not to, or has refused to look at the degree of penalties because it says, that penalties are a question for the legislature. Once the legislature has validly created a law, we're not going to determine what is an appropriate penalty. But that's created a, 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 a real distortion in our criminal laws where now that area where the court won't touch has become used as a way to scare people. And uh, I, I expect most people watching this reflecting on a $50,000 penalty if we go out into public and protest would say, I'm not going to take that risk. Uh, because if I do get prosecuted, then that will break me, that will break my family. And so the law becomes used as a device to dissuade people, but to cause them to self-regulate. Yeah? So the law may not even be applied to be effective from the government's position. And so that that, that sort of um, real dissonance between the court's position on penalties and their actual use to create disproportionate uh, laws is a, is, is, a, is a real concern. Um, and, and maybe, uh, Violet, and you might speak to that later, just the nature of, of, of these offences, because uh, Violet, um, uh, who, who is our second presenter, uh, is an Australian climate activist and has been uh, subject to these laws as well as uh, to a, uh, a conviction, a criminal conviction under the law. She is a, a member of Fireproof Australia and Extinction Rebellion. Uh, Violet was briefly jailed uh, on remand for uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, blocking the Sydney Harbour Bridge in, in 2022, which uh, went to international news uh, sources and was, was publicised around the world, much to Australia's fame. Uh, but we did uh, successfully appeal her 15-month uh, jail conviction uh, in March 2023, after the judge found that her conviction was based on false information uh, from the police uh, about an ambulance uh, being blocked in, during her protest, and, and Violet may speak to that. So please welcome Violet uh, to explain the, the nature of these laws on the ground from, the, uh, I was going to say the cold face, but probably an uh, inappropriate <laughs> term. Thanks, Brendan, and thank you, Az, um, very much for your presentation. I, I very much appreciate what you had to say both about our right to protest and the need for it at this time. And uh, before I get into the nuts and bolts of what I have to say, I do want to acknowledge that I'm on tourable in Yaraga, Yagara country here at the moment. And um, I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that the fight that we are in to protect this country is one that has been going on since colonization. And we are joining this fight and, and this government that is repressing environmental protesters has been imprisoning and murdering First Nations people for, for much the same plight of, as protecting country and, and their country at that. So I just want to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that First Nations people um, need our support in uh, protecting their culture and, and acknowledging that um, the youth are carrying this torch of, of culture after a genocide that occurred in this country. And, um, and uh, yeah, I guess from my perspective and my story, I just, I wanted to let you all know that I definitely didn't expect this to be my trajectory. Um, if you'd asked me six years ago what I would be doing, probably the last thing I would have said is a climate activist facing prison. Um, but uh, you know, I um, I knew a little bit about climate change, but and that's you know I didn't I didn't think that it was my problem. I didn't think it was my responsibility. Um, that was somebody else's problem. You know, I wasn't a scientist. I'm not a politician. 
Um, but as new information came to me about the urgency of the issue and the way that protest works to change a society, I was convinced that I had to leave behind what I thought was going to be my life and, and begin this journey of protecting our life support systems. And I hope that many of you will also join us in that struggle. Um, basically, uh, you know, the climate movement hasn't been in this position of um, people being imprisoned. We've been asking a little bit nicer uh, throughout the movement of us knowing for a very long time now that, that this is uh, our life support systems are at threat. And, um, you know, as part of that asking, I say, I just want you all to know that we have done all the petitions. We've, we've um, the second largest petition in Australia is to declare a climate and ecological emergency. And that was ignored. Um, we've done one day marches. You might remember the school strike marches, um, which were just massive and that was ignored. And so, uh, you know, the tactics that we're using are escalating and, and that is causing this, these changes in these laws, but it is absolutely necessary that we keep going. Um, you have people like Professor Hans Schellenhuber who says that we are in the end game and that pretty soon we have to choose between taking unprecedented action or accepting it is too late and bear the consequences. And so what is it? What does unprecedented action in your life look like? And, um, you know, we have Australia's most eminent climate scientist, Professor Will Steffen, um, who recently passed away. But as his final quote to us, he says that on our current trajectory, we are headed for the collapse of our globalised civilization and a precipitous drop in human population, um, which will lead to hell on earth conditions. So, um we're sort of done being polite and um, and we have to be strategic and we have to le leverage power. And, and there is a beautiful history of civil resistance and protest being at the forefront of social change. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, you know, we have a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws and, and we are being utterly failed. A government is there to serve its people and one would say that the exact antithesis of serving its people is murdering them um, and so I would say that this system is unjust and therefore it, it, it's validating us disrupting um, you know people sort of not sure why we block roads well it, it's to disrupt business as usual uh, we have to leverage power and disrupt the broadcast of this prescribed narrative that everything is okay and, and we have to sound the alarm and, and act in proportion to the threat. And all of you have to act in proportion to this threat, which is massive. We need to be panicking. Um, we need to be more annoying. And the fact that these laws are changing is actually a sign that we are succeeding in being more annoying as, as, and as you know, challenging as that uh, is for us to face. You know, first they laugh at you and then they fight you and then you win. You know, we can't win this battle against a government that, you know, is concerned with economic growth when, you know, there is no economy on a dead planet. And so we have to change their mind, change their opinion, stand in the way of that business as usual. And when we do that, they're going to change these laws. And, and throughout history, when this has happened and social movements have become really strong enough that, um, the government has started to, or the elites have started to fight against the protesters. Um, we have two choices. You know, we have this choice. We can either back down and, and try and find ways around that aren't so annoying that they won't try and fight us, which seems counterproductive, or we face these laws and um, and we step up and step into our courage and say, okay, well, nobody wants to be arrested. Nobody wants to be a prison, go to prison. I guarantee you that. But what we do want is a livable planet. And, um, and so, yeah, we have to expose their violence in that way. And, and, and this is actually how this system works. It's called the backfire effect. So for some reason, um, humans uh, care more about our rights and freedoms to protest than they do about our livable planet. That's like why we're here talking about our human right to protest and justice and freedom, um, which seems crazy to me, but um, that's okay. I'll work with that anyway and be here with you in this. Um, so, so basically when we are repressed by the state, that is what mobilizes people to come to our defense because we do care about justice. We care about our freedoms. 
um, because that freedom could be coming for us, even though I guarantee you the collapse of our livable planet is coming for you. Um, and uh, I know that firsthand. I live in Lismore at the moment, which, um, you know, they're saying um, we've got a lot of, you know, homeless people in Lismore and they're calling it a housing crisis because of Airbnb, but it's it's absolutely not. This is climate refugees. We're starting to see mass climate refugees in Australia right now. So, so this, you know, this crisis is already hitting us really hard. And, um, and so we need to be really um, stepping up to that. And, and part of that is facing this, these laws. And, and like I said, it's really effective because when they, um, when they repress us, people want to step up and, and join us. Um, I want to talk about the Franklin. Does anyone here? I just like, I mean, a lot of your, a lot of your view cameras aren't on, but um, you know, if you've heard of the Franklin um, campaign, uh, maybe give me a wave or something. I can see you all. Yeah, you've heard of that. Great, <laughs> nice few of you. Okay, so with the Franklin, when they um, when they had people coming, it was a really divisive campaign um, because in the local area, men, not many people in the local area wanted to protect this beautiful native natural environment that was just um, really important ecosystem down in Tasmania. And so what they did was they uh, had to run this campaign where they called people from all around the country to come and protect. Now, it was about 20 to 30 people running this campaign on site, and they had hundreds of people from all around the country flying in, doing an action, getting in the way of the death machine, stopping the bulldozers, and then going home. They did a, a survey of what was the number one thing that encouraged people to turn up to this campaign. And the number one thing that encouraged people to turn up to protect the Franklin wasn't that the fact that they wanted to protect the ecosystems, which I'm sure was part of the motivation, but it wasn't the most motivating factor. The most motivating factor was the fact they saw other people being arrested and, and they wanted to stand in solidarity with, uh, with the rest of, of society who was protecting this area. They wanted to stand against the man or whatever, however that works. So um, that's so similar kind of what happened to me. So when I was sentenced to this 15 month prison sentence um, for blocking the Harbour Bridge, um, at the time the Downing Courts were incredibly, um, they were in, being incredibly rep uh, repressive to all the uh, protesters. Um, the day before my action or two days before my action, someone was put in prison for three months for in, for running onto an NRL football pitch during a game. That's how it, it was crazy. It was that like so disproportionate. And then when they put me in prison, there was these mass uprises all around the country. There was protests in every single state of the country. There was mass petitions and it shamed the courts into being more reasonable and so um, now since then uh, the police have tried this to charge more protesters in New South Wales with the 144 charge that um, I was sent to prison for and and the courts have completely backed down because of the the backlash that they received from the repression so everybody who sort of contributed to that campaign about uh, even though the law is still there um, everybody who contributed to that campaign to get me out of prison also protected every single protester afterwards from being um, having the same fate because there was that massive backlash. Um, so, yeah, I think what I'm really trying to get across to you is that even though these laws are scary and, and uh, as um, Brendan said, that potentially what it does is when people see, oh, it's a massive fine or it's prison sentence, maybe we don't want to um, risk that much to protest. Uh, the most powerful thing you can do is risk that much to protest because when we face these laws and we allow, expose ourselves to the violence of the system, um, that encourages people to come and stand and link arms with us and um, and you won't be alone. I was never alone. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'll just leave you with a final comment and then we're going to talk, go into some questions, but, um, you know, I've said it a few times, but literally the life support systems of our planet are at stake. And um, and so we, d we don't want to go to prison. We don't want to get arrested. But the most important thing you can do is is step up and, and, and face those repressive laws. And, and when people do get hit with those repressive laws is to make a massive outcry about, about it and demand that um, we have the right to protest, but also that we have the right to have a livable planet and that they have to stop killing our planet um and so what else could be more important than a livable planet um please help us and join the front line
that's my statement to you all. There you go. Thank you, Coco. That was incredibly powerful, of course. Um, and uh, just such a, a telling testament to your willingness to, to break and push the system's limits. And, and I think um, also to show, as you said, that the system is reacting uh, because it is working. And we forget uh, as lawyers, as parliamentarians, that our entire democratic system is based on that overreaction. So the English Civil War, which led to democracy, modern democracy, was based on the king dragging parliamentarians out of parliament and putting them onto the cold stone floors of the Tower of London, which is where we get the idea of chilling effect on free speech, because you were left on a, on a cold floor to think on the sin of speaking out against authority. And that led to the Civil War, which involved the overthrow of the king and the establishment of the modern constitutional order that is now turning on you. And so, you know, this, this sort of cycle is being perpetuated from within an apparent democratic institution, um, but so powerful and, and, and so uh, such a motivating uh, a talk. I wonder if um, both you and Az might have a chance to ask each other questions before we move into a Q&A, because you come from different perspectives and you can speak to each other's experiences and expertise. Uh, so uh, Az, do you have any questions uh, that you might ask Violet or vice versa, and then well, in about 10 minutes, we'll move over to the audience. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, as an academic, I'm always really interested to see how these laws that we're studying, you know, on the books are actually playing out in real life. And Violet, you've been on the front lines for a while. Um, be really interested to hear a little bit more about how the police are uh, in your experience and in the experience of communities you work with, are uh, um, suppressing protests at the moment? Yeah, thanks, Az. So um, at the moment, there's obviously three power players that are trying to pr suppress protest. Um, there's the political class, so there's the ones like creating these laws, and then there's the judiciary, which are enforcing the laws through the courts. And then there's the actual police who are, who are on the ground, and that's the ones that I, as a street protester, engage with the most. Um, what's most concerning about the way that the police are responding to the political class changing the law is that they are becoming more punitive even before it reaches the judiciary. So uh, they come in, um, they overcharge protesters. So, for example, my protest on the Harbour Bridge, I had a smoke emitter, which is like an emergency smoke beacon. Um, they charged me with having an explosive device for having a smoke emitter. And, and, and all these extra charges, um, if we go floppy, they'll charge us with resisting arrest, which is the opposite of resisting is just uh, is relaxing your body. And that's what we do. And so they're, they're overcharging us. And what that allows them to do is to give us really repressive bail conditions. And um, so, for example, before I even hit Silverwater Prison after my sentencing, before that, I spent almost an entire year on bail where um, for a majority of that time I was on house arrest. And so my home became my prison for an entire year. Um, just a caveat also, that was my um, 27th arrest, that Harbour Bridge protest. So you generally don't start with that kind of level of repression, but peaceful protest should, should never be criminalized in that way. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, so they're using these punitive bail conditions to really repress us. And, um, and that is, uh, and then often like a lot of protesters, when they get to the courts, the de the morning of the courts, the protester will walk in and think, oh, I'm I'm about to um, face potentially 12 years in prison, for example, and then the police will just drop all of the charges an hour before you go in to see the magistrate and all you're left is with a fine only offence. And so, you know, there's all of this stress, this worry, the cost of hiring a lawyer, all of this stuff that we don't have. I mean, I, you know, four years on the activist frontline, I haven't been paid as an activist. You know, it's, it's not a job that gets a lot of money. So to pay for a lawyer, which is another thing I maybe want to say to all of you who are lawyers, like we really, or like you're studying law, we really, really need more support, legal support on the front line um, for that reason that the police are being quite punitive. Um, good question, As I, I have uh, one for you, actually. Could I, could I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah go ahead, great. sure. Um, I mean, how do you think 
so you know I'm a as a protester I'm blocking the harbour bridge how do you think that the law should handle us I mean, as an international human rights lawyer, I think we should, at the very minimum, um, behave in a way that's in line with our international human rights law obligations. And that will also ensure that our, we have a healthier democracy. So we have... Um, our, our politicians are really quick to uh, rightly condemn suppression of protests in other places. So when Iran started to kill its protesters and uh, really have repressive um, policies for protesters, the Australian politicians of both sides rightly stood up and said, this is wrong. Now, we're not killing protesters in this country, but we do have bipartisan support for suppression of protests. And it's not just in coalition states that we're seeing these kinds of legislation passing. We're seeing uh, anti-protest laws being passed in Labor states, and we're also seeing anti-protest laws pass in coalition states with the support of Labor oppositions too. Um, and it's a really worrying thing because there's the way that it seems to get translated onto the on the ground is that certain protesters, people pro protesting climate change, for example, are being treated differently on the ground than a lot of other protesters might be. So the way that anti-vax protesters, for example, were treated has been different to the way that some climate change protesters have been treated. Um, so we know that the political class understands the importance of protest. They keep talking about how important protest is. When passing every single one of these pieces of legislation that I mentioned, they all start by saying, protest is so important to democracy. <laughs> and here are the way we're going to remove that right. Um, so we know they know. We know it's not rocket science. And we know that they are capable of creating safe spaces for protesters. Uh, what we need to see now is some of these uh, anti-protest laws hopefully get challenged successfully and get removed from the books so that there isn't that discretion there to silence many voices that, as we mentioned, have no other platform. And if democracy is about having the voices of everyone heard when you're removing the right to protest, then you, it, it really is a massive challenge to, to the health of the democracy of this country. And I've, I've heard that people give us, you know, like there's ratings on our democratic status in comparison mm -hmm. to people around the world. And given the fact that we did just have Colette, Dr. Colette, um, put in prison for three months as a peaceful protester. Where do you think that that rates our democratic status, you know, in reality? I mean, we've got an idea of who we are, but in reality, where does that put us? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm not qualified to rate us, but what I can absolutely say is that oppressive governments don't happen overnight. You know, these things happen slowly and when we start removing the right to protest, we're edging towards more and more oppressive and suppressive regimes. Uh, if you don't put an end to it, we're not immune. Um, a lot of places didn't start off with the repressive governments that they have today. It's always been a slow process of uh, often using the legal system to get to that place. So um, it's, it's not, uh, it's not, there's nothing about Australia that makes us immune uh, to, yeah. to oppression. Um, and so you'd say that, that that our democracy is sort of failing us at the moment absolutely. in that way. Yeah. And we put people like you uh, and others in prison. Absolutely it is. Yeah. yeah. And what's the appropriate response to that in, in your opinion? I think that the appropriate response to that is, as you said, to support protesters. Um, and I think we need more people out on the street personally. I'm not speaking for my institution, but I, we actually need more people on the streets because I, I think it should be an anomaly. And I think social movements succeed when they have mass um, masses of people on, on the streets uh, demanding mm -hmm. change. Um, and so we have to make it unacceptable 
for peaceful protesters to be placed in prison or fined the extraordinary fines that um, have been introduced recently. And, uh, and we need to protect those who are putting their bodies on the line to demand something better for all of us, for, for our country and, and people. Um, Everyone, everything, <laughs> for everywhere everything for the at earth. this point. It's like there's no, there's no, you know, greater cause or greater injustice than losing the livability of our planet, right? It's like exactly. trees and birds, yeah. like magpies are going extinct, like koalas, you know, it's just devastating. I love this idea of of talking about mass protest and needing mass protest. Obviously, we've come through COVID and it was a time when we couldn't really be calling out for mass protest and, and mm. now we can. And every movement, um, frontline movement under the sun is trying to organise mass protests, which is fantastic. And there's so many around. Extinction Rebellion in Nam, Melbourne is a really powerful, really strong organisation. So if anybody here is inspired by what we've talked about today, I really encourage you to join Extinction Rebellion Melbourne um, because, yeah, that's the community that radicalised me. I was part of Extinction Rebellion Westside, which runs out of Footscray, and um, that was, yeah, just a um, fantastic community. Um, I, I do want to say, like, with mass protests, though, the studies, the social science around protesting and, and the numbers that we need, because it can be quite overwhelming to think, oh, we just need everybody, but the reality of the situation is um, Erica Chenoweth did this study on um, what's more imp uh, what's more effective, violent protest or nonviolent protest. And um, she thought there would be violent protest, but ended up proving that nonviolent protest was more effective than violent protest. And also as part of that study, realized that no movement had ever failed if it's managed to achieve 3.5% of the population actively engaged at a one given time in, in a um in a campaign. So I guess that's the hope that I want to leave you all is that we don't need everybody. We just need 3.5% of the population actively engaged. And, um, and then we can make massive change together. And, and also part of Chenoweth's work is to say that the more radical you're willing to be, the less people we need. So the more you're willing to sacrifice of yourself, the less people you need to also bring along on the day. <laughs> I, I'm interested, Violet, to, to hear you describe yourself as, as radical, um, given the, the nature of the threat and what you're doing, and, and that, that your protests have not actually been radical as we might think of it in the history of protests. Um, yeah. and, and the concern about uh, what's happening across Australia in trying to cast climate protesters as extremists so as to justify the extreme nature of the response. Uh, and what As spoke about was proportionality and the need for tailoring of the law. And by casting you as radical and extreme, then the law can somehow be justified. Are you concerned about that? I, I, was, I was really interested to hear you say, I'm a radical, because uh, that sort of falls into a, a certain narrative, maybe. Yeah, I, I think it's a fine line. Obviously, um, if we talk about um, like comparatively to what everybody in Australia is doing right now, uh, I've recently got called Australia's most infamous radical, climate radical, which I was like, that is crazy because if I'm the most radical person, then we're in real trouble um, <laughs> because, yeah, obviously proportionately to what we face, um, blocking a road for 20 minutes seems quite unradical. That seems very... Um, disproportionate even. Uh, I'm reading a book called How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which is on the philosophy of property damage and protest, which is another more interesting conversation we can get into on another day. But um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, it is it's, it is about proportionality. We are in radical times and radical action is necessary. And I don't want to normalise what we're doing. You know, blocking a road, um, being arrested, going to prison isn't normal. It's not the things that I would be doing under normal circumstances. We are in a radical time and therefore it requires all of us to take radical action. Okay. <laughs> it sort of takes the breath out of someone to hear that from another person. Um, but as uh, that, that is sort of the problem here, right? In that you spoke about these international laws that talk about proportionality, but, uh, but it's a proportionality between protecting the rights of protesters versus protecting everyone else's rights. But the entity that decides that is the government that's being challenged. And so you end up in this odd situation where the government is, is almost using proportionality to justify its own disproportionality, 
Is there a way to make the law work better? Is your view that proportionality does work in its current context within within uh, within human rights law or, or public law, or do we need to just say there is a, an absolute right to protest? I mean, there's no question that human rights protections in our country are lacking, um, not just in protecting protests, but in so many other areas. Uh, the implied freedom of political communication doesn't go nearly far enough to ensure the health of our democracy and to make sure that we're not passing legislation like this. Um, it we, we absolutely need greater protections. Um, you're right. I mean, at the international arena, it's, it's very hard to challenge human rights violations. Again, not just in this space, but in every other space. Um, we know that our governments violate human rights everywhere all the time and then claim sovereignty um, that the international uh, bodies don't have teeth, that there's very little they can do to enforce um, their findings against a country like Australia, if, even if we go through the very lengthy, very costly, very time consuming process of making a complaint to the Human Rights um, Committee uh, and, and in some cases other bodies. So um, th there's no question that international law doesn't do enough um, and it's difficult to enforce. And there's no question that domestically we don't have enough protections. So a Bill of Rights, we would need a Bill of Rights <laughs> <All right. laughs> is my answer yeah. always. Like all lawyers, we keep coming back to, to that, that issue. Um, but, think, but, you know, in terms of radicalism, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Violet, please continue. Well, I just want to say that, you know, it's it's sort of almost too late to for that sort of talk now we have like maybe a year maybe two to like radically shift our society we're, as you said we're at 1.7 now between two degrees and three degrees of warming are tipping points that cascade us into an uninhabitable planet and um, that is why they wanted to limit warming to 1.5 we're now at 1.7 and and we have stuff that's already locked into the system because warming doesn't happen as the gases hit the atmosphere so, you know, this, this transition needed to happen yesterday. If we don't have mass resistance and social change within the next 12 months, we got a party like there's no tomorrow. We can get a Bill of Rights or not. So it doesn't matter. Violet, can I ask you, um, sometimes when we talk about protests, people say, oh, but people can go on social media. Um, you can always just, you know, tweet about it. Um, why do you take the action that you do? Why, why isn't tweeting about it enough? Uh, I guess it comes back to proportionality that obviously, you know, uh, writing a tweet, and, and that's not to say I don't tweet, I, I do a variety of tactics, I've even signed a petition once, um, but uh, but, you know, it's it's just one of those things where um, we need to get the message out and, and we need to disrupt um, the the current narrative, like you can have the best messaging in the world, but when you're just talking in your own little bubble on social media or you're just holding a sign politely on the side of the road, you're not actually breaking through into people's day about the emergency that we're in. And, and it is about displaying that emergency for yourself. It's about, about being panicked about the fact and, and, and I don't think that tweeting in, into a, my group of people who are following me is being panicked enough about the loss of our life support systems. Also, um, you know, we can get siloed off. Uh, they're already talking about um, stopping our live streams from being able to go live, um, which is really distressing because that's, you know, a, a huge part of our platform is using social media to communicate about our disruption. But the suffragettes didn't need social media. And so I'm pretty confident we can do it without it anyway. <laughs> Okay, so we have uh, a few audience questions. Um, uh, one which I, I think we've sort of covered off in a little bit in your talk, as but so it might be one for Coco as well. But this idea that all, if we do this, should all views be protected? Should we give uh, equivalent to, to all harmful views? Everyone has the right to get out there and protest about whatever they like. And it turns into anarchy, this idea that uh, protest is, a, is, is something which everyone gets to do, no matter how horrible and how nasty they are. What's, what's your view on that, Violet? Um, and then, oh, sorry, sorry. As, um, yeah. as is the expert, you take it as. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Well, yeah, international human rights law says absolutely not. Um, yeah. If you're promoting hate, then uh, your speech is not protected. If you're promoting violence, your assembly is not protected. So um, not all views are the same. Um, and you can't just say that you can protest about anything and everything and you have freedom of expression and assembly, you don't. Okay. Yeah, I just maybe will extend on that saying that when we are looking to protest, it's not about just expressing our dissent, it's about being strategic as well. And so um, just to extend on that, uh, you know, it's we're trying to affect change and that change is um, about protecting people and, as, as said, not about um, vilifying people. And that, that's a big difference. And that's a big part of the nonviolence creed as well. Um, we try and avoid blaming and shaming and all that sort of stuff and stay as, as peaceful and loving as possible. Uh, when, when Martin Luther King talks about nonviolence and what nonviolence is, it's, it's actually about being as open-hearted as possible in your disruption. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's the complete antithesis of that hate speech. And you take a really, do. you take a quite a broad strategic view to the way it's not just just turning up on the Sydney Harbour Bridge one day and saying, oh, I might lie down here. It sounds like you have a, a, a very articulated strategy. And yeah, that so into account. Yeah. that that campaign that uh, where I ended up on the Harbour Bridge, we were actually it was in the lead up to the New South Wales election. Um, we were blocking roads once a week, every week for seven weeks leading up to that protest. So um, we'd actually caught the roads minister and Dominic Perrottet in our uh, protests, as well as several of the magistrates that were um, judging us those days that we were in court. So it was, it, but it was all about affecting the um, making sure that climate was the number one issue in the election by dominating the narrative by every week. And, and sometimes every day because they got to the point where the radio stations were like, oh, those environmental protesters, they might be on your road today. And so every day they people heard that there was environmental protesters. They understood that people were stressed out, were anxious. It wasn't fading into the background of, of the political discourse at the time of the election. And as you know, we got many teals and Greens are elected in, in that in New South Wales election. So yeah, it is it is really strategic. And and you know, I wouldn't sacrifice my freedom for the whim of it. This this is yeah, you know yeah, of course. I mean so the, the flip side question playing the devil's advocate here is that sometimes those protesters push push otherwise uh sort of passive voters into acting against what you're 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 pushing and, and uh the, the famous example of that is uh Bob Brown's uh, anti anti Adani, it's very hard to say, anti Adani convoy into Queensland, which some some commentators said actually caused the landslide against Labor because it had climate policies and and the Liberals picked that up. So what's again okay. devil's advocate here, but I'm just saying what's your response to that? That sometimes you push too hard and it actually backfires against the the rest of us who are trying to fight the power. The rest of us. All right. So <laughs> yeah, again, interesting I, I, framing. Kavia was the most devil's advocate there. <laughs> so listen, you know, that narrative is the Murdoch narrative. That's the narrative that comes up every time protesters come onto the scene. It happened with the suffragettes. Oh, and they say, but people, people don't say climate change isn't real because protesters are annoying. They say, shut up the protesters, but we're going to vote Greens. And, and with the Bob Brown convoy, I, it wasn't the Bob Brown convoy that lost the election. It was Clive Palmer's billions of dollars into his election campaign so that he could get his coal mine approved in, in that same area of the Adani mine. And so, um, you know, but, but, but Murdoch wants you to believe that. And, and all of our media is really dominated by Murdoch. So I, I mentioned before that the second largest protest in Australia, uh, petition in Australia was to declare a climate emergency. The first is to, is, uh, it was after that, and it was, um, to investigate Murdoch's corruption. And so, you know, it's really challenging when these, these narratives arrive that, that protesting doesn't work because um, it does, it does all throughout history. And, and during that election, we did see massive swings and debate on the climate. And um, yeah, so don't don't fall for the right-wing discourse, I would say, if okay. that comes up. I'll try not to fall for it. <laughs> Thank you, Marla. And, and while I'm being provocative, I pulled up the question here, which I think is relevant to as, which is Victoria's got a charter of, of human rights. Um, and 
it's passed and enforced anti-protest laws. So Bill of Rights or, or no, this is what, what, what states will do. So what's the Bill of Rights going to solve at the national level? So there's there's a provocative question yeah. to balance things out. Yeah. Paul, we, as lawyers, we hate realising that the law is not always the answer to everything um, and having to talk about that. But you're right. I mean, Victoria does have, uh, Queensland has, uh, you know, human rights protections as well. Um, some, a lot of, not a lot, but a couple of the states that have passed this anti-protest laws do have some form of human rights protection. Um, I would argue that the protections offered are not particularly strong and um, don't have, uh, enough there to ensure that those laws aren't passed. Um, but I think your question demands a, a more a bigger answer of actually what what's actually needed is uh, a country that sees the importance of protests for its health and its democracy, um, a people that are willing to put up with inconvenience when they realise that that inconvenience affords them rights and a recognition that so many of the things that we enjoy today were won through protest. And so having to be stuck in uh, a lane of traffic um, because someone is highlighting the fact that the you know we're we're facing this climate disaster is not the end of the world so yeah as a lawyer I want legal protections in there but as a citizen of this country and as a global citizen what I want most of all is a recognition that the planet is dying and we need to do something about it and not only to protect the people who are putting their bodies on the line to do something about it, but um, also ensuring that they're safe and uh, ensuring that they can continue drawing attention to what is happening as well. So we need political change, we need social change, and legal change is unfortunately only a very small piece of a much bigger holistic puzzle here of what we need to do to create something better. Thank you. Um, as, uh, I, I, I know that there are more questions, uh, but we have run short on time. Um, and so I, I think everyone is very grateful for such a compelling talk. It's hard to be excited about talks like this because they are so confronting. Um, but I think it's incredibly enlightened from both of you and that experience that both of you have and that deep-seated expertise both on the ground and from uh, an international perspective is so welcome. Uh, so please, everyone, thank uh, uh, virtually thank our wonderful presenters. Um, and that unfortunately brings this session to a close.